Dune Fall of the Imperium is the seventh or so official supplement to come out for the Dune Adventures in the Imperium role-playing game, which was first published by Modiphius in 2021. I did a review of the core rulebook a few years back that covers the basics of the game, but I haven't been keeping up with the half dozen or so supplements that have come out for it since. This latest supplement, Fall of the Imperium, presents a very ambitious and technically difficult series of adventures for your players. And I mean difficult from the designer's perspective. It attempts to allow your players to step into some of the key moments covered in the first two novels, Dune and Dune Messiah, as representatives of their own house. Which is to say, everything that happens in the novels still happens, but your characters play along the edges and your players have to sort of pretend to forget that major events are about to happen in order to enjoy some of the story beats and motivations within the adventures. So yeah, if you're thinking railroad, then you're on the right track. But that being said, the adventures are still compelling. There are four major acts that each contain three parts, and then those three parts are each divided into three acts, which I found really confusing. You have acts, then unnamed parts, then acts. I have to warn you now that the rest of this video has spoilers, which is the only way I'm able to discuss adventure modules and one of the main reasons I don't do so very often. But first, let's take a look at the sponsor for this video, Cloud Empress. Cloud Empress is making a triumphant return to Kickstarter with two new expansions, Land of the Living and Land of the Dead. These expansions are standalone adventures that build upon the Cloud Empress rulebook, offering a unique opportunity to delve into the captivating world of science fantasy roleplaying using the rules from Mothership 1E. Backers from the original Cloud Empress campaign were treated to some stunning adventure pamphlets. This campaign offers copies of the first campaign books along with all the setting books and rulebooks printed in hardcover, complete with a new storage box. The Land of the Living expansion presents a 60-page standalone hex crawl co-authored by M. Matson. Players will navigate a dynamic landscape shaped by spore towers and rifts in time and space. This expansion delves into the lives of indigenous communities within the Cloud Empress world introducing new movement-based spores, NPCs, relics, and spells. The Land of the Dead expansion offers a 60-page standalone hex crawl where players explore a landscape ravaged by the impact of a fallen cloud city. Unravel the mysteries surrounding Prince Bug's broken tower and confront the challenges of survival in this desolate realm. With these expansions, players will encounter more detailed social interactions and survival challenges, pushing the boundaries of the Cloud Empress universe. For those interested in embarking on this adventure, follow the Cloud Empress Kickstarter campaign linked below and discover more about the project. Journey into the extraordinary world of Cloud Empress. Alright, back to the Dune thing. The first act puts your characters in front row seats to the invasion of Arrakis by the Harkonnens, and you're expected to be down in the trenches during the slaughter and forced to choose your alliance between the Harkonnens and the Atreides. The second act is more of an original scenario where you're hunting down the secret of the Harkonnens, which is the fact that their spice production has stopped and this will eventually lead to the collapse of the Imperial government if they can't get it fixed. The third act draws them into a confrontation between the Emperor and House Harkonnen on the planet of Arrakis, since the cessation of spice exports have drawn things to a head. And it ends with the death of the beast Raban and the final clash between the Fremen and the Emperor's forces. The fourth and final act puts us in the world of the second book, Dune Messiah, where Emperor of the Known Universe, Paul Maddib Atreides, has launched a jihad that is killing billions of people. The players are forced to choose sides and either help the tyrannical new emperor or save planets full of innocent people here and there. If this seems like a strange premise for an adventure module, this sentence should clear things up. This campaign is really about being part of the greatest and most iconic parts of the novel. That's really what this is, and it should be very appealing for fans of the novels who want more than anything to just be in the novels somehow. In this video, I wanna walk you through two of the four main acts and just show you how the adventures are presented. And you can be the judge on if this is an appealing product to you or not. But just to reiterate my thoughts on the underlying Dune RPG, I think it does an awesome job of straddling interpersonal roleplay and more zoomed out almost domain level play where players control multiple characters. And the adventures in these books don't forget that particular strength. Another major strength of the underlying Dune RPG is that it embraces multi-planetary adventures. You're not just stuck on Arrakis. And this adventure book incorporates that strength very well. 
Act 1 starts you in a safe house in Arakeen, the desert city on Arrakis that is adjacent to the headquarters of House Atreides. You're talking with an informer named Ibn El Mal, who tells you that he has seen agents from House Akaz in the city. House Akaz is an enemy of House Harkonnen, so it's odd that they would be conducting operations on Arrakis. If this is already starting to feel like a spy novel, that's the point. All of the adventures in this campaign are focused on politics, rumors, espionage, and leverage against houses. And by the way, you do get some original art pieces in this campaign book, but a lot of the illustrations are pulled from the original Korra rulebook, such as this one here. Remember that your characters are meant to represent their own house, and they are always trying to advance their house, whether by allying with the winning side of some conflict or amassing blackmail. Players really, really have to put themselves in that mindset rather than in the more typical mindset of personal enrichment and survival. Anyway, in order to keep the story going in a particular way, you have to put your players on some railroad tracks here. Regardless of whether or not they ally themselves with this house it has, they appear outwardly to do so, but have the option of selling them out to the Harkonnens. Either way, there's a secret spice hoard that they are meant to steal. And then in the final scene, they raid the spice cache that's located 500 miles out in the desert, and in doing so, they either kill Ikaz agents or Harkonnen guards. And then that's the end of that segment. The players end up either as allies to House Ikaz or House Harkonnen and have a good amount of spice that they can maybe translate into assets for their character sheets. The next part in Act 1 has the players responding to a secret Harkonnen transmission originating in the middle of the desert. They pretty much have to go investigate immediately or the story here just doesn't work. So considering that you really want to have players who are in on this kind of adventuring, you pretty much have to tell them, look, this is kind of railroady. You got to take the plot hooks that I throw out at you, but solve the individual problems however you want. Anyway, the PCs are meant to go into the desert to track down a mysterious Harkonnen transmission. And remember, at this point in the timeline, the Harkonnen are supposed to have vacated the planet and handed everything over to the new stewards of Arrakis, the House Atreides. But here we have some clandestine Harkonnen outpost of some sort. Players are asked to make an understand check to find the location of the installation. And then another harder understand role to reveal a door. The thing is about these checks, is that as the GM, you really need the players to find the damn door. So there's no penalty for them failing these checks because they either find the door to the secret outpost or the scenario grinds to a halt. But they are given a choice of blasting down the door or hacking it with a simple battle or understand roll. Inside, they find a murdered Harkonnen soldier, then seven more dead soldiers and a bunch of weapons. Eventually, they discover that someone has just left the facility in a small surface-to-space shuttle and the whole outpost is rigged to self-destruct. The GM is asked to make the escape from this imminent explosion as suspenseful as possible, including a simple understand or battle roll. You don't actually want your players to get caught in the explosion, regardless of what they roll, so this is sort of a fake roll that doesn't have any consequence for failure. The last scene in this scenario is pretty inspired. The PCs will pursue the mysterious shuttle and follow it into a guild highliner, one of those mega ships that the spacing guild uses to transport the ships of various houses. This is a great illustration, but again, this one's recycled from the core rulebook. Anyway, the PCs go into the shuttle and get surprise attacked by this Harkonnen spy who trained as a Sardaukar, which is like the elite Imperial Special Forces. This is supposed to be a knockdown, drag out fight. Check out the assets that this guy has, which are intended to pose a threat even if he's captured as a prisoner. The fight is so daunting that there is actually a blurb down here that suggests the GM can downgrade the difficulty and just make the operative a plain assassin or spy, stat wise. But once the PCs defeat this guy, they read his notes and uncover what has transpired, which is that the Harkonnen agents who were killed in that outpost we're supposed to be gathering intel on the Atreides in preparation for the big Harkonnen attack. And they were sloppy in their intel gathering, so the deadly operative was sent to kill them all in order to maintain operational security. This last segment of the part called an act, see why this is confusing? This last bit is actually pretty vague. PCs are meant to visit the Imperial capital planet called Kaitan, Kaitan and do some investigation. It says, it is up to the game master to decide how long to spend on Kaitane. If they want to expand the adventures before the attack, this is the place to do it. 
This campaign book actually says this sort of thing a lot, where it suggests the GM can insert other adventures into the timeline. I'm not sure how practical that advice is. One thing that really did plague me though, was how players are supposed to be doggedly investigating the mysterious comings and goings of the Harkonnen on Arrakis, but in actuality, everyone at the table would have already known that the Harkonnen are going to surprise attack the Atreides. It's in the beginning of the first novel and it's featured in every movie and TV show adaptation of that novel. So players have to suspend that knowledge somehow while investigating this mystery. That's a tough thing to ask players to do, I think. But yeah, this segment ends with the surprise attack on the Atreides. Part two of act one, which itself is called act one, starts with putting PCs down on Arrakis in the besieged city of Arrakeen in the midst of the violent Harkonnen invasion. It actually says right here that it should be really run as a tour through the fall of Arrakeen instead of a traditional adventure. So it's kind of like a Universal Studios ride where there are all these sights and sounds around you, but you're never in any real danger. Except there are some important choices to be made that I think every GM should foist on the players. Of the 10 random encounters that can be thrown at the PCs in the midst of the burning city of Arakeen, I'd recommend these two. This one right here forces PCs to choose a side, Harkonnen or Atreides. This bit is important right here. It says that at least one soldier from the opposing side makes a run for it, later informing their commanders. So that means the PC's choice here has lasting ramifications. The other critical encounter in this scene is this one here, where PCs are made to choose between fighting a bunch of Harkonnens or executing an Atreides soldier. These are tough decisions to make, but they counteract the railroad feeling that you otherwise get here. The next part really drives home this choice between Harkonnen and Atreides by once again forcing the PCs to either execute an Atreides soldier or fight the Harkonnens. There are a few fun branches here if the PCs decide to fight and ultimately get taken prisoner. They could end up getting rescued by the Atreides or meet the Baron Harkonnen or Piter de Vries where they can talk their way into an alliance. But no matter what happens, they have to escape from Arakeen. In the final act of Act 1, PCs will meet one or both of two major NPCs, the Beast Raban and or Gurney Halleck. The idea here is to solidify the PC's choice and alliances, which will influence and flavor the campaign later down the line. Again, right here, you have this suggestion of inserting adventures in this part of the timeline where the Harkonnens have retaken Arrakis. Act two, Maud Deeb, is the second of four major acts in this whole book, and I wanna briefly go over some of it so that you can see just how varied and interesting this campaign can get. In the first act, you are definitely following some plot beats set on tracks, but here, it gets a little bit more flexible. It starts PCs off in a completely different place, on an ice moon called Montaglion, where they are sitting in a fancy chalet negotiating with their house's spice agent, a chome director. Chome, if you recall, is the super mega corporation entity that facilitates the trade of spice amongst the houses. This scene is meant to give your PCs the opportunity to secure a good spice buying arrangement for their house. What that ultimately means mechanically in the game is really just one line on your character sheet under traits that says, spice supply that could be used in situations to gain you more revenue for your house. The game is very amorphous in that sense, but again, your players really just need to be in the mindset of trying to improve the position of their house and not just further their own personal goals in order for a lot of these scenes to work as intended. Anyway, while you're conducting negotiations, agents from a minor house, House Bakara, hold everyone hostage in order to force the home director to sign a spice deal that would keep their house afloat. The PCs are expected to fight and overpower the terrorists and maybe segue the action into a ski chase that lasts for maybe three to five rounds, at which point the Chome director gets away safely and the scene ends. But this is the part I thought was most fascinating in Act 2, which is the writers utilizing one of the game's unique play modes called Architect Play, where players send specialists, spies, and supporting characters to follow leads and conduct investigations. The investigations are presented in very broad strokes, such as this Chome business meeting, which can take place on any of three planets and tests either the battle or communication skill. These investigations can be played out as full scenes, or they can just be set up as a single skill check to be rolled. There are six of these kinds of investigations presented. 
then PCs will zero in and connect with a supplier NPC, who then connects them with a spice smuggler. Ultimately, they are still just trying to secure a good spice deal for their house, and that is the entire reason for everything that's happened in this adventure segment. I think that's probably enough recap to give you an idea of the adventure structure and scope in this campaign. Again, it extends to four major acts. In the third act, the Imperium falls and PCs are scrambling to pick sides or play both sides as everyone is plotting against each other. And in the final act, the PCs are scheming across different planets as Paul Maud Deeb wages what is essentially genocide in the name of his religion. The fall of Kaitane is a notable scenario because of the many scene options the GM is given to choose from, and there is a time element where the city deteriorates more and more under Fremen attack. It's a fun design approach compared to the linear story beats in a lot of the other scenarios in this campaign. There are eight pages at the end of the book that offer guidance on what the Empire looks like under the rule of Paul Atreides. It explains what kind of ruler he is, what the Bene Gesserit want from him, what the guild's position looks like at this point, as well as some important societal details, starting with the most important one, why Paul is wiping out entire planets. The idea is simple. He wants these planets to pledge their loyalty to him, and if they don't, they're destroyed. All right, here are my thoughts on Dune Fall of the Imperium, a campaign book for Dune Adventures in the Imperium. Wordy presentation. I've actually gotten pretty spoiled by the more modern and innovative approaches to campaign and adventure presentation these days. This book is more like an old school campaign book where scenes are story beats all laid out in expositional paragraphs of text. Occasionally the book dips into more efficient and easy to reference modes of text, but it largely reads like a novel summary or something. More challenges. I would have loved to see more suggested tests. One thing I thought was clever was that the authors created dice challenges here and there where the outcome wasn't just binary. There were some creatively constructed outcomes, whether in the case of success or failure, but as clever as these were, I wish there had been more of these in each scene. Pulls off a technically difficult premise. I don't want to criticize the railroady nature of this campaign book because that's just a necessary feature given what the creators were trying to accomplish. The premise here is, let's put players in front row seats to the biggest events that happen in the first two Dune novels. Well, to do that, you have to employ at least some rails, and I think they pulled it off for the most part. For me personally, the scenes with more player options were more appealing and really it's always rough to see a published scenario of forced plot points on players, but this is the nature of this particular campaign. If you recall in the core rulebook, there is ample guidance on how to create your own adventures in the Dune universe, but if you wanted something more guided and tied to the source material pretty tightly, then this is the campaign for you. Loaded with cool ideas if you want to go off rails. There is nothing stopping a GM from just raiding this book for ideas. You can take the setups for any of the scenes in this book and convert them into open-ended game sessions. What you'd probably want to plan as the GM is problems for players to solve rather than plot points for them to get to. But this book is full of interesting locations, NPCs, and NPC motivations that you can use in any way you like. Excellent art and presentation. Even though I've been sleeping on this product line for a few years, I did review the core rulebook way back and remember being highly impressed with the cover art, internal art, and general internal layout. And from the looks of it, they've continued with this level of quality, even if they've recycled some of the illustrations. It's still all just very professionally executed. Yeah, so that's Dune Fall of the Imperium. A bit of a weird duck in that it walks you through a couple of famous novels, which if you're playing this game, you've probably already read. In which case, doing those early investigations into what the Harkonnens are up to is kind of laughable. But there is so much intrigue and violence packed into these scenarios that as long as your head is in the right space, this campaign could be a blast. Let me know if you plan on bringing this one to your table and what your thoughts are on how it's been presented. Thanks as always for watching. See ya.